And hopefully now we can get a better intuitive understanding for what the gauge pressure is, is just how much extra pressure there is above the normal atmospheric pressure. The gauge pressure tells you how much extra pressure you're feeling above the normal atmospheric pressure. So once you actually understand the gauge pressure, you should hardly need to plug into the equation to figure out what it is. We just compare it to the atmospheric pressure and see how much above the atmospheric pressure it is. For example, we know that the normal atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, uh, but this, in our situation, the actual pressure is 1.7 atmospheres. So how much above the normal atmospheric pressure are we? Well, 7 tenths of an atmosphere. So the gauge pressure is 7 tenths of an atmosphere. If you needed to, you could then translate this into pascals. So then you might use this conversion ratio to translate this into pascals if necessary. But it was convenient to start in atmospheres because we know what an atmospheric pressure is just one atmosphere there. Um, the reason this is called the gauge pressure is that if you actually use a pressure gauge, it doesn't actually measure P, it measures this. Um, the gauge pressure tells you how much above atmospheric pressure you are. For example, because uh, in a sense, atmospheric pressure is boring. That's just what we're always at. What's interesting is whether we're above atmospheric pressure. So people would use, say, a pressure gauge to test what the pressure is in their tires, in their car. Uh, obviously, you want the pressure in your tires to be above atmospheric pressure. So um, you, you would use that gauge. And the gauge doesn't actually tell you the total pressure in your tires. It just tells you how much extra pressure your tires have above the normal atmospheric pressure. OK, so if we just use the symbol P, we just need the actual total absolute pressure. But if we say gauge pressure, that's the difference between the actual pressure and subtracting out the atmosphere. OK, um, so it's important to uh, be comfortable with uh, both those concepts. So for example, let's say that the gauge pressure is 7 times 10 to the 5th pascals. Let's say that the gauge pressure is 7 times 10 to the 5th pascals. And let's see if we can figure out what the actual absolute pressure is. All right, well, we want to use this formula up here. Uh, let's see uh, if there's anything we can plug in here. Well, what could we plug in for the gauge pressure? 7 times 10 to the 5th pascal. Yep. What would, we, what would we plug in for P? Well, that's the question. So we're not going to plug in anything for P. That's what we're trying to figure out. Now, here's the trickiest part. What should I plug in for the atmospheric pressure? Um, 1.01 times 10 to the 5th. Okay, that's good. In the previous problem, we just plugged in one atmosphere for the atmospheric pressure, but that's because we were working in atmospheres. If you're working in atmospheres, you can just plug in one atmosphere for atmospheric pressure. But here, it looks like we want to work with pascals. Well, then we have to use this number over here. So that's, again, an important reason that you have to have that number recorded someplace that you can find it. OK, so the tricky thing here is to plug in atmospheric pressure in pascals over here. One atmosphere is 1.01 times 10 to the fifth pascals. All right, and now we're going to have to do some algebra to get the P by itself. Um, what, what should we do to this equation to solve for P here? Uh, add the atmospheric pressure to the gauge. Yeah, we need to add that to both sides. way to get rid of a subtraction is by doing the opposite and adding. So what are we going to have left on the right-hand side of our equation after we do that addition? That was the whole point, to get rid of this. All right, and now take your time and work out what we're going to have on the left-hand side. 
need your calculator if you want to. Is it just 8.01 times 10 to the 10th? Okay, that's good. It's good that you didn't say 10 to the 10th. All right, good. You could always confirm that on your calculator, but that's right. This is like 7x, and this is like 1.01x. That comes out to be 8.01x. x just happened to be 10 to the 5th, so we don't add these exponents here. Okay, good. Uh, what units is this in? And now, I guess we're done. Uh, we worked out to the answer. So the question is, what was the actual pressure? Well, it's 8.01 times 10 to the 5th pascals. And again, let's just think about the simple intuition here. Um, the normal atmospheric pressure is about 1 times 10 to the 5th pascals. But our gauge pressure here told us that we had an extra 7 times 10 to the 5th pascals. That's how much extra pressure we have above the atmospheric. So actually, in a sense, we should hardly need all this algebra. We really understand what the gauge pressure means. We know that we can just start with the atmospheric pressure and add this extra, and that'll give us the actual pressure over here. So this is just 7 units bigger than, our, um, than the normal atmospheric pressure. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, so it's important to be able to go back and forth between gauge pressure and actual pressure, just like it's important to be able to go back and forth between atmospheres and pascals. Uh, because some problems you're interested in gauge pressure, and some you're interested in actual pressure. As far as symbols are concerned, oh, I said I was going to use lowercase p for pressure, but it looks like I'm using uppercase p. All right. Anyway, I'm using p for pressure. Uh, anyway, as far as symbols are concerned, when we're talking about the actual pressure, I'm just using a p. But the gauge pressure, we're actually writing that out as gauge. So this means the actual pressure. Another name for actual pressure is just the absolute pressure. This is just the total pressure, the total pressure. And the gauge is the extra pressure above atmospheric. OK. Good. Now, um, we want to get some intuition for what pressure means. Uh, so in this chapter, we're focusing on gases. Um, so we, sh we should have an analogy for what, how the gas behaves. Uh, well, um, we know that gases uh, are really made out of tiny little molecules. Even though we can't see them, the gases are really made out of billions or trillions or quadrillions or a really big number of molecules, basically, all flying around. And we can imagine those molecules as tiny, tiny little ping pong balls. So we can think of the molecules as a bunch of tiny ping pong balls flying around. The only reason that we don't notice that is because they're so small that we can't see them. But a gas is really made of all those tiny little ping pong balls, those gas molecules. So the analogy we're going to have is, let's imagine a cardboard box filled with ping pong balls that are flying around. So we're going to stick with this analogy, a, ping, uh, a cardboard box filled with those ping pong balls. Well then, what's the pressure? The pressure occurs when the ping pong balls hit the sides of the box. The pressure is when these ping pong balls are hitting the sides of the box. So what would it mean if the pressure is increasing? Well, that would mean that the ping pong balls are hitting the sides of the box more often or more forcefully. So in our analogy, the more often the ping pong balls hit the sides of the box, or the more forcefully they hit it, the greater the pressure is, the pressure on the sides of the box. So we can think of the pressure as the impact of the ping pong balls on the side of that box. So we'll uh, keep coming back to that analogy. Of course, if you put an object inside of the box, then it would feel pressure from the ping pong balls too. If we put, say, a little doll inside the box, well then the doll would keep getting hit by the ping pong balls too. And then the doll would feel that same pressure. So the pressure is coming when the ping pong balls hit something. Uh, but even if there's nothing in the box, you can still have pressure on the sides of the box. Uh, let's see, a couple other points here. Uh, I should mention that pressure is a scalar, even though force is a vector. Even though force is a vector, pressure is a scalar, because all we're really using here is the magnitude of the force. So I think uh, we've seen I like to use a dot for magnitude. So technically, we're just putting in the magnitude of the force here. Pressure doesn't have a direction. It's just a scalar. I don't think you guys are going to learn about any new vectors for the rest of the course. For the rest of the semester, you're just going to be focusing on scalars. Uh, you'll see some new vectors next semester. So I'll put a dot here to remind ourselves this is just the magnitude of the force. The direction here doesn't matter. One thing to keep in mind is that pressure is not the same thing as force. People oftentimes make that mistake because the words sound kind of similar. If the question asks them to find the force, a lot of the time they just find the pressure and they think that's the right answer. But it's not. Those are two different things. Uh, so let's say... Let's see, I don't know if we want to think of it as a component. The force is one of the things that determines how much pressure 
there is. The pressure is the force over the area. I don't know, uh, we probably can't boil it down uh, any more than that. 